In the name of God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, I am bold to bring you this word today. Amen. We start with a fresh start. The flood waters have abated, and the ark sits on dry ground, and Noah and his sons, so the story goes, are granted an audience with the Almighty. It is a great and terrible story from start to finish. A great and terrible story that we share with our kids and make into nursery quilts and storybooks. And we have little arcs that kids play with and the animals march in and out two by two. We wonder about a lot of things where this story is concerned. I wonder about the state of hygiene on this floating menagerie. I've seen documentaries where people have tried to replicate the the building methods for the ark to see that it was seaworthy and on and on and on it goes. We want it to be absolutely true. We look for the lost ark in the mountains of Turkey or wherever. Or we turn it into a nursery story to amuse the kiddies. It is neither absolutely true, nor is it a nursery story. What if? What if this is a cautionary tale about the kingdom of God? You remember the kingdom of God, don't you? That thing that Jesus is always talking about? The thing we sing about and pray for and long for. The thing we're not really sure how to define. The kingdom of God. Maybe this is a story about the kingdom of God. Noah, as you'll remember, is a righteous person and his family with him by default. And he gets a warning in a difficult time and he builds a floating shelter and in that ugly, smelly barge, so the story goes, Noah and his immediate family and a problematic collection of animals are saved from destruction. So far, so good. The story is already resonating in your head. You want to hear about the dove that comes back and you want to hear about how they got closed up in the ark and how they got out of the ark. It doesn't matter. I'm not going there. Because this is a carefully crafted piece of religious mythology. Yes, religious mythology. There have been historical floods And yes, the people who survive these events often credit divine intervention with their safety. But calling Noah's story, or anything else for that matter, religious mythology, does not rob the story of its power. It cannot, for this is a powerful story. A powerful story about how mere humans might engage with the Almighty. And Noah's story contains necessary life lessons for any who would profess their faith in God. At the beginning of the story, for the first nine chapters of or eight and a half chapters of Genesis, God can do no wrong. Remember, God created everything from nothing. God is the center and source of all of these things that are happening that we are hearing about. God sees all. God knows all. And by 
the end of chapter 6, beginning of chapter 7 of Genesis, God seems to approve of nothing. The world is wicked. It's all gone to hell. And the only person worth talking about is Noah. I'll remind you of how the story starts. Genesis 6, verses 5 to 8. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Let that sink in for a minute. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind in the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found sight found favor in the sight of the Lord. Really. Everything but Noah. And the, the animals, just for good measure, I suppose, this is how we set the scene that we tell to our kids that we want them to memorize and we sing happy little songs about the animals two by two. It's an incredible story. And frankly, it better not be true. But this represents the state of human relations with the divinity at some far off point in our history. God would, should, and could do just that if God chose. That's what we believed. And the only Two options we had would be to tread very carefully and try and live righteously and hope not to anger the Lord or throw it all over your shoulder and live for yourself and don't give a darn about anything. Sound familiar? Of course it does. Because that state of affairs hasn't really changed. But in this story, the relationship is about to change. And yes, the manner of the change is described as horribly violent and needlessly destructive. But major social change often is both of those things. But here in chapter 9, once the dust or water has settled, the author reveals that God is setting new terms, new rules for engagement. Behold, I will make a covenant with you and all that come after you. I want to stop right here and give you a quick lesson on the mechanics of ancient weaponry. Right? God makes a promise. And God says, the sign of this promise is going to be my bow. I'm going to set my bow in the sky. Now, we all played inappropriate games in our youth like cowboys and Indians, right? So we all know how a bow works. A bow is shaped what? Like this. Follows the arc of the sky. You want a bow to work effectively, you grab it in the middle of the arc, you pull it back, and what is pointing at you? The shape of the bow. That's the lethal side of the thing, isn't it? And God puts a bow in the sky with the dangerous end pointing up. Think about that. This is how God reminds God's self of a promise. There's an argument for saying that God is threatening God's self. I offer you this little tidbit, not my own thinking, by the way, Because we often get hung up on the violent 
the so-called violent nature of God's activity in the Old Testament. And we shouldn't. What we read and describe as God's violence is most often human activity that uses God as an excuse to act violently. Still happens. Natural disasters and other inexplicable things are blamed on God still. But God is not intrinsically violent. Where the Bible offers God's words or thoughts, such offerings must always be imaginatively interpreted. Why? Because God does not grant interviews. God doesn't offer one-on-ones. God is experienced, God's word, God's will, God's everything is experienced through other means. This has always been so. And that brings us to Mark's gospel. To Mark's gospel and Jesus. Jesus, who is baptized, tempted, and suddenly in the spotlight. All down to John's arrest. Jesus, who in Mark's gospel at least, seems to appear out of nowhere. And in that sudden appearance of this mysterious holy man, we will find yet another new way to experience the divine. Jesus is introduced in Mark's gospel particularly, but in the scriptures as well, in the middle of the story. We rather stumble upon him. There's no logical reason for Jesus to be there except that there he is. And in the middle of that story, humanity still has all its usual problems. Nothing much has changed since the bad old days when God decided that God had some regret over his creative influence. There is still, in Jesus' day, war and occupation and hunger and inequity. There are still powerful people lording it over those who might just be powerless, but they don't know. And out of the desert and into our story, our story, this is, walks Jesus, the beloved, the beloved. And unlike Noah's story, God, the Gospels describe a different kind of engagement here. Here in Roman-occupied Palestine, when the world has failed to live up to God's expectations, instead of retribution, God sends a representative. Sure, there have been prophets and priests and kings in the past. And look what happened when that sort of overt power was placed in human hands never really worked out that well, did it? If you consider your late chapters of the Old Testament. So here in this time, in this place, instead of an authority figure, instead of someone to run the temple or rule the nation, God sends a teacher. The covenant with Noah was God's promise to be aware, a promise to give the world a chance. That's why he points the bow upwards. It is a promise by God to contain God's awesome power. Never again. Never again. That promise, still in effect, by the way, that promise allowed the history of the Hebrew people to play itself out. And a ragged history it is. But in that whole cycle of history, while it brought people to an awareness of God, history didn't bring God any closer. 
did it. The kingdom of God remained a distant, mysterious promise, something only vaguely defined. But in Jesus, fresh from his dusty desert sojourn and standing in for his mentor, John the Baptist, in Jesus, God offers the promise of engagement, not detachment. No more is God the distant overseer, for Jesus declares God to be in the midst of us. His first proclamation in the gospel, the kingdom of God has come near. He might as well have said, here. And the kingdom has come not to threaten or cajole, not as an act of retribution. No, the kingdom has come in hope of reconciliation. Now, there are folks, good Christian folks, church people, at whose tables we've sat. There are people whom we know and love who will declare without hesitation that we will not see God's delight until the world has either been torn down or we have torn it down. There are good people who declare that destruction is necessary before we see the kingdom of God. Lovely, faithful people made in God's image whose image of God is still that of flood director and chief calamitist. They still see God as one who is waiting for the next chance to wipe the slate clean and get rid of this miserable humanity. Oh, except for the particular faithful, of course. They will be safe. All you have to do is say the right words and do the right things, and you are guaranteed safety through the coming catastrophe. There are people whom we love who believe that to the bottom of their feet. And that kind of talk is hard to hear, and these days it seems to be all around us. And in our current circumstances, in the current state of the world, it is easy enough to believe. In fact, it is even aspirational. If only one day soon, God, please let it be so. The world is a disappointing and often terrifying place. And wouldn't God's kingdom be better? And isn't it easier to think that one of these days, as the story goes, Jesus will return and God will once again clean house and start over. And the faithful, like Noah, will be saved And all will be well. The problem is Jesus suggests something else. Jesus, who comes into the middle of a broken world, in the middle of a broken time, to a significantly broken people, Jesus comes and brings the kingdom. Here it is, right now. He points to the nearness of it and invites us to look for it and work for it and to revel in the joy of it now. Not later, not after so many centuries of this or that. Now. Because the act of reconciliation happens in the midst of disaster, in the presence of disaster. The power of love and compassion, mercy and grace is most notable when the world is at its worst and when the world needs it most. 
Jesus call on us to love both our enemies and our neighbors is a call to glorious defiance in the face of what is. Because the powers of destruction depend on our discouragement. The suffering world doesn't need God to wipe out the wicked. What the suffering world needs most is for Jesus' followers to live into Jesus' promise, to live out the kingdom, which is right here. Don't take my word for it. Jesus said so. The stories of our faith, the stories that would remind us of our part in the drama, still need imaginative interpretation. And if you think I've gone too far, well, so be it. We can have a chat about that. But I believe that that is the task of faithfulness. We won't always get it right. I don't always get it right. But I'd rather be wrong trying than wrong waiting for God to wipe us all out and start again. We can choose. We can and do choose. We can choose between the simple. God will take care of it. The approach of those who imagine that another ground-clearing act of God is our last best hope. Or we can choose to follow Jesus, who says to us even now, the kingdom has come near. And that is a challenge that I can't resist. You see, the former, the God will take care of us, requires only that we stay on the side of perfection, which history suggests has been, oh, I don't know, impossible for us. But the latter, the latter calls us to action in pursuit of Jesus. The latter calls us to have eyes tuned for the frequencies of heaven here on earth. The latter brings us to life rather than waiting for death. In a world gone mad, in this world that we call home gone mad, which would you choose? Amen.